This can also happen due to sexual relationships. That body has a certain memory. Physical memory beyond a certain point that what you pick up will cause a certain level of confusion. If you just as much as hold somebody's hand, you will develop runanubandha. This is why in India if you come, people will do like this. Nobody will give salt to you or will receive salt from you. I would have somewhere between five to seven showers a day because your system becomes so sensitive, you sat on this cushion, now you're conscious what this cushion is doing to you, so you want to wash. A six-year-old girl came home one day from school and asked, Mama, how was I born? The mother was embarrassed. She said, a stoke dropped you. Said, okay. She noted down, Mama, how are you born? A stoke dropped me too. Mama, how is grandmama born? A stoke dropped her too. Then the girl became serious and she went down and th sat down and started writing something in her homework. Then the mother was feeling uncomfortable, she finished her cooking and then the girl had finished her homework and left the book there, she went and read. So the essay was about the family tree. So the girl had written, for three generations in my family, nobody had a natural birth. <laughs> so because of absurd ideas, either we exaggerate something or we try to unnecessarily play it down. It has a certain role in your life. If you make it too big, you will become perverted in your head. If you try to obliterate it, you will become even more perverted in your mind. So there are many reasons why one indulges in sex. For some, it is just pleasure. For some, it is a way of building this bond and companionship. Otherwise, people feel they are going away from each other. They may be just fine, but a lot of people, it is psyched in their mind that if they are not sexually involved, they are actually moving away. Not true. You can be very close to somebody and need not be involved in any physical manner, isn't it? But societies are psyching, especially in this part of the world, people are hugely psyched. If there is no sexuality, you don't really have a relationship. In fact, the word relationship, it's only… it took me some time to understand that here, if you say a relationship, you are supposed to understand it's sex-based relationship. Nothing else is a relationship. If… if I… I can have a very strong relationship with you and not be concerned about your body, isn't it? Yes? I may not be drawn to your body in any way, but I can have a very powerful relationship with you. But all those possibilities are completely discounted. A relationship means you must be in some way physically involved, man, woman or man, man, woman, woman, whatever you like. Essentially, it's body-based what kind of body is individual choices, but essentially it is body-based. This has happened because somewhere our identification in the body has gone beyond normal levels of identity. It is excessive identification with the body. That is why body-based relationships have become the crux of the society. Essentially, most of the sexuality that's happening on the planet is happening because of a certain compulsiveness, isn't it? It's a compulsive drive. After all, now I'm speaking, this is a kind of energy. You're looking at me, this is a kind of energy. You're listening to me, this is a kind of energy. These are different expressions of the same life energy, isn't it? Now sexuality is also another expression of the same energy. Now, one has to decide how much of his energy, in which direction he wants to send it. Because after all, 
You are a limited amount of energy, isn't it? See, it's just like you have an income. Let's say you have five thousand dollars a month. How much for the house rent? How much for eating? How much for schooling? How much just for fun? How much for vacation? You are portion, isn't it? Tomorrow morning, you got your salary. In the evening, you went out and blew it up. Now the next month is going to be trouble, isn't it? Of course you have a credit card but <laughs> everything in your life, if you are handling your life sensibly, everything in your life is apportioned according to your understanding, your need and your capability, isn't it so? Yes? Your money, time, energy, isn't everything allotted the way you like to arrange it? This is also the same thing. How much of it? First of all, do you need it? Or are you doing it because of socially you are psyched? If there is a need, if I ask you to stop it, you will become perverted because it will all happen in your head. If somebody is telling you, you have to do it, if you don't do it, you are not normal, another kind of perversion will come, both are not needed. It is just that if there is such a drive, it is there, but you understand the limitation of it. After all, you are not going after man or woman, we already looked at this, you are going after a certain level of pleasantness. So once you experience a certain level of pleasantness, wouldn't you like to dig deeper into this? Because whatever pleasantness happened, maybe you use the other person, but the pleasantness happened within you, right? So suppose, anyway the pleasantness is happening within you, the other person is just a key to open this. Wouldn't you like to have the key in your own hands? Yes? That if you sit like this, you are on full scale. <laughs> you don't need anybody because to extract pleasure out of somebody, you have to play any number of tricks. It's, it's the, it doesn't happen simply. This is called as courting. <laughs> Once you go to the court, the judgment day will come. It takes enormous amount of time, effort, energy and all kinds of other things, frustrations, jealousies, problems, everything attached to it. You are here constantly looking, what can I get out of this person, what can I get out of that person? This is a con job. It's called a love affair <laughs> but it's a con job. But if you are extremely ecstatic by yourself, when you are being with people, it's about st sharing your ecstasy. It is about if they are not touched by it, somehow to touch them with it, rather than seeing what you can squeeze out of them. The whole fundamentals of your life will change. Runanabhanda means the physical memory that you carry within you. This can happen because of blood relationship, this can also happen due to sexual relationships, that body has a certain memory. It's not appropriate to say genetic memory. Runanubandha is not like genetic factors being transmitted from parent to child, not on that level. There is a physical memory of remembering where you came from, not necessarily in terms of tone of your skin, shape of your nose, how you're built, your race, not that. It is just that if you just as much as hold somebody's hand, you will develop runanubandha. This is why in India if you come, people will do like this. They don't want to do that. They will love you like this. And there are many things, they won't give certain substances. Nobody will give salt to you or will receive salt from you. If you try to give them salt, you'll say, keep it here. They don't want to take it from your hands. 
the till or the sesame seeds, they won't take it from you. Certain types of soils, nobody will receive it from you. If you want to give soil to somebody, any kind of soil, there are rituals where soil is given, always you keep it down, I'll pick it from there. Never take it from somebody's hands, because you will develop runanubandha. Because the culture is constantly conscious of not building bondage, to keep the bondage of life to the minimal extent, only to the extent it's necessary, because you're working towards your liberation. Because of that, this awareness and these sensitivities have come. So the body remembers any kind of intimacy, not only with another physical body, any kind of intimacy, even with any physical substance, it remembers. Certain types of substances are more capable of doing this, certain other types are less. So, for this we... here in the temple they're doing klesha nashana. Have you been through it, anybody? The fire... fire wash? That is, if you're not getting clean with a regular shower, We're burning you out <laughs> So what Kleshanasana is a way of burning various types of physical memories that we have picked up, not necessarily because of relationships, just by contact, just by coming in touch with so many things. People, situations, atmospheres, so many things, this body picks up memory. Physical memory, beyond a certain point that what you pick up, will cause a certain level of confusion. Confusion, not here, this confusion is a different thing, that is something you have earned. But physical confusion, if the body is confused, it can't come to ease. It is... Many of you have noticed this, certain days your body seems to be confused. Have you noticed this? Wherever you sit somehow, another day you sit down, ha. Huh. So, we created various systems to cleanse. One thing is fire wash, air wash, really. <laughs> of course, the water wash every day. When... you know, when I was in my... a period of time, when I was into lot of sadhana, I would have somewhere between five to seven showers a day. Because your system becomes so sensitive, you sat on this cushion, now you're conscious what this cushion is doing to you. So you want to wash, at least just water running over your body. Five to seven days, seven times a day, this is not like Calculated, I must do it five times or seven times. Whenever you feel like it, most yogis have shower at least twice a day, minimum. Usually it's a dip in the river, just at least once you dip in flowing water so that you're washed clean. And during the shift of southern hemisphere to northern hemisphere, which is right now, and again from north to south, in Jul June, July. These times, the winds are strong in tropical country, or at least in India. In the Indian subcontinent, the winds are strong. So, there are simple processes where you must go and stand in the wind, so that you get a wind wash, proper air wash. You will see it'll do wonders to you. You try this, when there is a strong breeze, just wear something loose and just simply stand there for half an hour, being conscious of this with your eyes closed, both this way and from the back, you get enough breeze flowing over you, you come back into your house and you feel like, ha, ah, so much lighter and better. You don't know this probably, all the sannyasis, all the sadhus and sannyasis always use very fine uh, sieved uh, mud, red earth to color their clothes. 
it's... it's... Uh, entire ashram is painted like this because it's just soil we used, okay? Soil with a certain... what? Uh, a certain adhesive sticks like paint. And all buildings in the ashram were painted like this. And all sadhus, sannyasis, those who are on spiritual path, wash their clothes with red earth, filtered earth, with that they wash. So that's why that color, that's how it's come. So either you must wash separately or every time you must coat it with some soil material so that the runanubhanda, the only runanubhanda that you hold is with the earth, not with people around you, not with things around you, just with the planet. That is okay because if you wear clothes, because the word soil here is used differently, if you wear soiled clothes <laughs> No, no, not like that. Dipped in red earth, if you wear these clothes, in some way it is a reminder for the body as to where it comes from and where it'll go. So those who are on the spiritual path always use clothes which have been dipped in filtered red earth. You won't see it, it won't... it doesn't feel like it, but actually the very color... actually the white clothes turn into mud color because it's been constantly washed with filtered earth. So washing runanubandha is... Uh, one way of doing it is you have a mud bath. So existentially, when physical memory overlaps upon itself, it will cause a physical level of confusion, which will bring a certain level of discomfort, lack of exuberance, lack of involvement with anything, that you become a veteran when you're living. You must be a veteran of life after you're done with it. Before you're done with it, you shouldn't become a veteran, isn't it? <laughs> but that will happen to you, that means in some way, because of overlapping memory, you become less alive to everything around you. That's what we concerned about, that you're becoming less alive. Scientific research into overcoming sexual compulsions and adopting celibacy are practiced by monks involves understanding the psychological, neurological and behavioral aspects of sexual desire and self-control. Here are some expanded strategies and findings from scientific research. Mindfulness practices can reduce sexual compulsivity by helping individuals become more aware of their thoughts and urges without acting on them impulsively. Regular meditation can help in developing greater self-control and reducing stress which can lower the frequency and intensity of sexual urges. For example, mindfulness meditation involves focusing on the present moment and accepting thoughts and feelings without judgment which can diminish the power of sexual urges. The research suggests that the brain can change with consistent practice of self-control and new habits. Monks often practice rigorous mental discipline which can rewire the brain to reduce sexual desire. Neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections, plays a key role in the process. Activities that promote neuroplasticity include learning new skills, meditation, and consistent practice of self-discipline. Some studies explore neurofeedback as a way to train the brain to regulate impulses better. Neurofeedback involves monitoring brain activity and providing real-time feedback, helping individuals learn to modulate brain function associated with compulsive behaviors. This technique has shown promise in treating various impulse control disorders. Regular physical exercise and a balanced diet can improve overall mental health and reduce stress, which in turn can help manage sexual urges. Physical activity releases endorphins, which can enhance mood and reduce stress. A healthy diet can support hormonal balance, which is essential for regulating sexual desire. Additionally, adequate sleep is crucial for maintaining hormonal balance and reducing impulsivity. Sleep deprivation can lead to increased stress and decreased ability to manage impulses. Being part of a supportive community, such as religious or spiritual groups, can provide motivation and accountability. These communities often offer structured environments that promote celibacy and self-discipline. Social support can play a crucial role in maintaining commitment to celibacy, providing encouragement and reducing feelings of isolation. 
monks often engage in ascetic practices that involve self-denial and discipline which can help in overcoming sexual desires. These practices are rooted in spiritual and philosophical beliefs and may include vows of celibacy, fasting and other forms of self-restraint. Ascetic practices can help individuals develop greater self-control and focus on spiritual growth. While the specific methods may vary, the key is consistency and commitment to the chosen practices. Overcoming sexual compulsions and adopting a lifestyle like that of a monk typically requires a combination of mental, physical and spiritual disciplines. It involves a holistic approach that addresses the underlying causes of compulsive behavior and promotes overall well-being.